parables are a bit like jokes. I mean, they're not jokes, and certainly the parable that we're going to hear today is actually deadly serious. But they're like jokes to the extent that they usually work towards some kind of punchline, as you might say, some, some pithy end which uh, brings the, the, the story, the picture, um, to a surprising conclusion. In a joke, it causes you, to, causes you to laugh out loud if it's a good joke. A good parable will do something inside you that, that, that challenges you to rethink God, God's relationship with the world, the challenges of discipleship, whatever it might be. The thing about today's parable, as I read it and reflect on it, is that it seems to be missing its punchline. Or rather, it's got a bit of a sort of a confusing mix of uh, alternative punchlines, which seem to be falling over each other a little bit. And there seems to be, as I hear the parable, a silence from Jesus at precisely that moment when you might have expected the parable giver to give the punchline. Listen to the parable and see what you think. It's from Matthew chapter 1, and uh, chapter 21, and it starts at verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized the slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. And so to me, the moment when one expects that, that punchline to come, is when Jesus concludes his story. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And it's a fairly straightforward story that he's told of an absentee landlord who's uh, left his vineyard, having done everything he could possibly do to allow for its fruitfulness, and left it in the control of the tenants. The tenants then reject his messages, messengers, his uh, servants sent, and then when the son himself arrives, do the most terrible thing and murder him. I mean, it's a fairly straightforward story of pure evil, uh, human selfishness that is very worse, at extreme, almost a caricature of uh, a human uh, rebellion 
and sinfulness. Jesus doesn't often do what he then does. I say, instead of giving his own punchline, he asks his audience. And they come up with what might seem the most obvious and natural conclusion to the story. Well, it's a, a story that requires retribution. The, that evil uh, needs to be challenged uh, with, with, with equal destruction, and those who have done such a wicked thing uh, must be put to death. Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus passes no comments uh, directly on the punchline that his audience give uh, to the parable. Uh, Jesus does give a response a bit later on, which seems to respond directly to the parable when he says, Therefore I tell you the kingdom will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. Now, to me, that's not quite the same punchline that the audience has given. This isn't, that isn't a, a, a story of retribution. You might say, really, that's a, a story of redeployment, where the fruitfulness of the vineyard is the owner's primary concern, and those who have the, uh, the wherewithal to produce that harvest, of course, will be put in charge. And that's what the Pharisees and the uh, uh, teachers of the law, the chief priests, uh, respond to with such anger, because they know it's aimed at them. That's a story of redeployment, not a story of retribution. But the way in which Jesus actually responds to that missing punchline, that, that pregnant pause after he's uh, delivered his story of obvious, clear and outright evil, is actually to offer another parable that seems quite unrelated, as if it's been plopped in there by accident by Matthew. Well, no, I don't think it's there by accident. It's a borrowed parable. It comes from Psalm 118, much simpler, but actually much more profound than the story that Jesus has just given. And it's not a parable of retribution. It's a parable of a rejected stone. Anybody who's watched a, a stonemason at work knows what, what care needs to be taken over choosing the right stone for the right place as, uh, as, as a, the building is constructed. One can imagine that uh, those two piles that a stonemason might work with, those stones which are um, uh, obviously uh, good material for, for, for making a strong structure and those bits that are just the cast-offs that maybe will fill things in. But here is a parable of the stonemason who takes from that pile of rejects and finds in that rejected stone something of such worth that actually he places it at, at the, the key place, whether it's the keystone or the cornerstone, uh, doesn't really matter. But it's, it's, a, it's a parable, not of retribution, but of lifting up, of finding the surprising value in the thing that otherwise seems to be rejected. I think one of the reasons why this parable uh, seems to be missing a punchline is because, of course, it's a story that is as yet unfinished, as Jesus tells it, because it is a parable about himself, very clearly the Son of God who comes and is rejected by his own people. And what will God now do is hanging in the air, and the people listening have not yet, of course, had the opportunity to find out what God will now, now do. Well, of course, we know now what God will do. And God will hang on the cross in Jesus with all the agony and pain and rejection that that entails. And through some uh, mystery that is, uh, is that we spend the, 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 net, the, right, the following centuries and millennia uh, exploring and unwrapping, in that lifting up of the rejected stone is actually our salvation. There is God's love, writ large and lifted up. That's how the story will actually end. So I think if we're to take something for ourselves, uh, from this, apart from that big theological uh, theme of what it means that God in Christ hangs on a cross. It's something about that question, and what will God now do? In a society where blame often can come to the fore, how will retribution work its way out in our world, be that political or social in our own relationships? Because there is a lot of evil, a lot of wrongdoing, a lot of stuff that is certainly not as God would want it to be. What will God now do? 
And we, like the crowd to whom Jesus addresses his parable, might be very quick to add our own punchline, and it would be one of retribution. And of course, justice does need to be done, needs to be done, and uh, things do need to be sorted out in our own world in real time. But I think this parable invites us to pause, as I think Jesus does. So we ask that question, and what will God now do? There's that well-known phrase, what would Jesus do, which we're invited to ask of ourselves in difficult ethical or personal situations. I think this is kind of the deeper theological equivalent to that. And so if this is the kind of God in whom we believe, the God made known in Jesus Christ who hangs on the cross, when we're faced with those moments when retribution seems to be the thing loudest in our ears, we do need to pause and ask that deep, profound question. And so what will God now do, the God we know in Jesus Christ?